Hi, welcome to the Family Teams Podcast. Our goal here is to help your family become a multi-generational team on mission by providing you with biblically rooted concepts, tools, and rhythms. Your hosts are Jeremy Pryor and Jefferson Bethke, and this season is all about crafting a family-friendly day of rest. We'll talk about the biblical idea of Sabbath, hear testimonies from different families, and also discuss practical ways to do this with kids. Make sure you give us a follow so you don't miss out on future episodes. All right, guys. Well, welcome uh, to the Family Teams Podcast. Uh, We are jumping in to seven uh, weeks of talking about the Sabbath, and we are so excited to introduce you to Yoel and Orly Ganor, who are good friends of ours who live in Israel. Um, Shalom, Yoel and Orly. Shalom. Shalom. (laughs) So this is a, this is a wonderful privilege. So uh, our friendship with the Ganors go back goes back. Uh, April, you want to describe where where we first met, real quick? Sure. Then... Yes, I think it was 2011 or 2000, the end of 2010, maybe. Um, our family went to Israel for the f- first time for all of us to go. Jeremy and I had been there. We met there as students in 1997, and then we came back with all of our kids. Um, when I when we were students in 97, I said if I ever get to come back here, I want to study Hebrew. I just, I had taken like a one little class and it just fascinated me. And so we knew we were heading back to Israel. We were so excited to bring all of our kids. And, um, I said, maybe this is one of those times we could try to find one of those schools. They call them an Ulpan or something. And so Jeremy did a bunch of research and, um, found Ulpan Or, where you can learn Hebrew at the speed of light. <laughs> and um, we were, that's how we decided where we were going to rent a house was the one that was within, within walking distance to where the Ulpan was at the time. And um, we were so glad we made that decision. <laughs> Ulpan mm-hmm. Or is amazing. Um, Yoel and Orly started it many years ago. I'll let them share their own story, but uh, we our experience there, they could teach all of our ages. Well, a lot of our, our kids were maybe, um, nine and 11 at the time, our oldest two took classes there and, um, their method of one-on-one instruction, taking little field trips with the instructor and going out in the public and kind of forcing you to use it, um, was super helpful, very memorable, very like engaging all the senses, and uh, it was a way to really move forward by leaps with the language and the culture and understanding the people and the city. We were in Jerusalem and um, it was all just very wonderful. We still have talk about it all the time. Yeah. Um, so that's how we met Yoel and Orly. Um, they are the couple who founded that and they have they have cracked the code of how to hire really good teachers. Yes. <laughs> we that's one thing we really admired was like we didn't Amazing have any people. bad experiences with any of the teachers. And they were all so great with yeah. the different levels and yeah, so wonderful. So we'd love for you guys to introduce yourselves a little bit. Um, and we're gonna dive into a conversation about the Sabbath in a minute. But yeah, Yoel and Orly tell uh, the audience just a little bit about uh, who you are. Okay, so we are Orly and Yoel, as it was said, and we are married for more than 41 years. Wow. <laughs> we have eight children, ages 41 to 23, and all but, all but two are married, and we have a bunch of charming grandchildren. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, I have a degree in education, Hebrew literature, Jewish philosophy, and I opened our company back in the 90s, hmm. 1993, something like that, when there was the big, big immigration from Russia. Hmm. Story is kind of, uh, you know, returning. Yes. And, uh, after several years of research and uh, invents, investing, uh, I designed our unique uh, rapid language acquisition methodology, and you described it fantastically. Today, we do <laughs> a lot of digital courses, and we have lots of, uh, you know, new innovations. Uh, so that's a little bit about us, about our Ulpan Yoel. So, um, April, you mentioned Ulpan Or. This is the name of our company. Actually, Ulpan in Hebrew 
means a place for studying something. A study and or means light. So the, it actually means the study of light. Mm -hmm. But actually, uh, it comes from the name of Orly. Orly, okay, mm -hmm. in Hebrew, it means my light. She's a light to me. So <laughs> um, oh, this, is, this is the foundation of um, oh. I never made that connection before. That's amazing. <laughs> 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 okay, about myself, I had uh, about 25 years of experience in the high-tech field before joining Orly because um, I wanted to be involved in something more spiritual than dealing with, you know, chips and technology, and uh, I'm happy for this move that I made. It happened about 25 years ago also, and Orly and I believe that Hebrew is the language in which the world was created. Mm -hmm. And this is the language which our patriarchs and our prophets spoke. Mm -hmm. And that's what drove me to be part of Ulpanor, where we teach and spread the Hebrew language around the world. So this is something for both of us, a very spiritual uh, enterprise, I would say. And we get so many uh, letters and inquiries from people around the world about Hebrew and its meaning for people's spiritual entity, those could be Christians, Jews, uh, Muslims, or you know, Buddhists, uh, what not, people realize that Hebrew is a special language. And when they touch it a little bit, or it touches them, sometimes very moving transformations occur. Mm -hmm. mm, yes. Yeah, so we, that, that is a that is something that our family has really adopted and and have we've learned a lot from the Ganors is just the the value of the Hebrew language and have encouraged a lot of our friends, especially the ones that do homeschool, to consider Hebrew as a potential language. You know, to be able to study the Bible in Hebrew, to be able to understand um, uh, Hebrew in the way that kind of the, the that mind thinks, and also to get to communicate directly with people in the modern day of Israel, which is uh, such a, an incredible story about how Hebrew as a language um, was, was resurrected in, in such a powerful way um, and, and brought into, uh, to become the, the primary language in Israel. So um, yeah, that's, that's a, we've been very influenced um, and believe in that. Now, we're, yeah. Not long ago, I actually discovered the emblem of Yale University. Yes. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar oh, with yes. it. Inside, there are Hebrew words, Urim, Betumin, written in Hebrew. Mm. It's a lux and veritas in uh, Latin language, which means light and truth. Mm. And it comes actually from the garment of the high priest. So it was fascinating for me to oh, discover wow. that actually they have Hebrew letters inside their emblem. And mm. uh, so. Wow. <laughs> That's very interesting. Yeah, you, you see you see it. Uh... Kind of emerging in different places and it, it does it, it has a powerful um i think resonance with people they don't it's spiritual they don't really understand mm -hmm. why the hebrew language is significant but you can feel there's depth there that's really bottomless and and that's part of the reason why our family is really um you know trying to try to go, try to really go into that so um so one of the hebrew words we want to teach you guys today on this podcast is shabbat um and uh and so we we have noticed, and I, we were just telling um, Yoel and, and Orly before this that there's been this a really explosion of interest in in keeping a Sabbath. Um, there's people that are more burnt out than ever. There's so much busyness in life. There's distractions, um, and that people are feeling tired and they're not recovering and they're not um, enjoying family and faith in the deep way that that a Sabbath day can really create for you. So um, and so we're going to be talking to different people who have established practices of the Sabbath. But I, before we talk about those who have recently uh, discovered uh, this, uh, this tradition and have begun to practice it, I wanted to, to talk to you all on Orly, people who have practices for much longer and who it, it goes back uh, for them uh, much further. So um, we're going to get into a little bit of history, but first I would just love for you guys to describe the typical Shabbat at the Ganor household. Like, what is that like today? And then I'd love to kind of go back in time a little bit and start to talk about maybe how that is different in different seasons of life. But what, what does it look like today for, for you and for your family? Uh, well, you know, Shabbat really is a special day in our family. Um, I just want to point out a few facts about Shabbat. Yeah. If one pays attention to time units, 
there are several natural units associated with the celestial bodies. Hmm. For instance, if we take the unit of one day, it is related to the revolution of Earth around itself, right? We have 24 hours, but it's one revolution. So day has some kind of cosmic meaning. A month is related to the revolution of moon around the Earth. And the year is related to the revolution of Earth around the sun. So these are sort of natural units of time related to some cosmic phenomena. But if you take the seven day week, it does not have any cosmic phenomena to relate to. Mm -hmm. So it merely attests for all human beings that the world was created by the Almighty in seven days. And the seventh day, the Shabbat, is the day on which God concluded the creation and put the world to rest. Mm -hmm. With this powerful manage, message, actually, Orly and I, we accept Shabbat in our family. Mm -hmm. And as well as what goes on in the family, Orly will tell you better than I. Okay, so the preparation for Shabbat, that's uh, one of the things you, you actually... The minute you uh, finish with the, the, the Shabbat, the, the previous Shabbat, you start organizing the week towards the, the next Shabbat. And what do I mean? Uh, first of all, you, we usually uh, invite guests. As our family grew, so our, today the great guests are mostly our kids, but, you know, people in the neighborhood are coming for Shabbat, and it's a whole, it's a feast, kind of. So every week we have kind of a feast. Yeah, students of ours who visit Jerusalem, they're always welcome to come to us And people from the neighborhood yeah, yeah. invite each other for yeah. the meal of Shabbat, and it's, it's a whole thing. Uh, and Shabbat is usually, it's like you, you say you're coming for a Kiddush. Kiddush is the beginning of the meal. So you're coming either for the morning Kiddush or for the evening Kiddush, but you're always coming for something that is involved, of course, with food. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I start to kind of exercising the, in my, my head is, okay, who is coming next Shabbat? What do I need to prepare? If it's a family, it's, you know, you prepare something that is special for them and so on. And, uh, and we are working really hard at our uh, work, but uh, still uh, kind of Wednesday, we're doing the shopping for Shabbat. Uh, and it's usually something special each Shabbat. And the cooking is usually on Thursday. And the halot, the smell of the halot is kind of all over the house yeah. on Thursday. And there is an, a special thing with Shabbat that you are not, we are not cooking on Shabbat. So um, we, we prepare everything in advance. And uh, in the winter, during the winter, you weren't in our house during winter, but in the winter we have special dishes that are on the uh, hot stove all through the Shabbat. Mm. So the smell is really, really good. And it's kind of the smell of Shabbat. Yeah, it, it really, Shabbat has its own special smell. Yeah. Special <laughs> yeah. So it's like, and you know, the, the chicken soup and the, all, all kinds of special dishes that are uh, for the Shabbat. Mm. And of course, you have special songs. Like there is a song uh, in the evening when the um, uh, men come home from the synagogue. So there is a tradition, a Jewish tradition that uh, tells us that when people come back home from the synagogue on the eve of Shabbat, they are escorted by angels who mm -hmm. want to support and participate in this uh, meal, the Shabbat meal. And there is a special song welcoming these angels and then parting from the angels. So it's a very nice uh, song. It's Many people in America sing it with this tune. Shalom Aleichem, Alafe Ashar. You can find it on YouTube. So this is... Uh... So the whole family is singing it. If you know of Rabbi Karlibach, you heard of him, Shlomo Karlibach? I don't think I have. Very, very, very famous rabbi uh, that used to uh, compose all kinds of tunes. And he has, uh, he has a lot of Shabbat, on Shabbat, but he has special tunes for Shabbat. And it's on it's on the net. You can find it on YouTube. Okay. Okay. Right. Shlomo Karliba. Okay. And another song that Orly mentioned, which is very important, is this is the song that the husband sings for his wife with admiration. Okay. This actually is a song from uh, Solomon's Proverbs uh, about the woman who does everything. It's all symbolic, of course. Of course. But uh, 
you know, when we do that, when I sing that, I, I especially, you know, focus on my wife, Orly, and tell how much I appreciate what she does, not only for Shabbat, but every day. And all the women in Judaism and so on. So it's kind of nice, and it's a tradition that the kids, you know, mm. get, get uh, from childhood. And there is also the priestly blessing that the parents bless their kids. Mm. You know, uh, the priestly blessing that has the three verses there. So we usually recite it on Shabbat. We put our head, hands on the uh, heads of our children and we bless them with those blessings. And the nice thing is when they um, are getting married, you, the husband, the uh, father is uh, putting his hands on the wife's, the, the, you know, the daughter-in-law or the son-in-law. Yes. So they are all our kids uh, on the Shabbat Eve. So it's really nice. And they're all coming and getting this uh, blessing. Mm. Mm. So yeah. all these things really, really make Shabbat really special. And, and symbolically, I just wanted to mention that when you take the Star of David, it has six corners, right? But in the middle, there is some kind of a space. And the six corners are related to the sixth day of creation. And the space inside, this is Shabbat. This is the seventh day that mm. gives its energy to all the six weeks day, weekdays. Okay. Mm. So, oh. Uh, oh, wow. It's like the energy source for, oh, that's really cool. I like that. Yes. That's a great symbol. Mm. That's very helpful. So, and so that evening, and it, one of the things we noticed is that there's also just, it seems so many families, so many kids are driving to their parents' houses, like on Shabbat, you just see even, even their twenties and thirties. Um, how, how does, how does it work in terms of when do families tend to start their own like Shabbat in their generation versus go to their parents' house? Um, how did you work it? How does that work out usually in Israel? Okay. Usually um, at the beginning of the marriage, they want to be alone. They want to do Shabbat on their own. Um, but again, like the, they come home in order to, you know, to, to get some of the uh, warmth and the, the things they remember. Uh, so they come from time to time and it's nice and the, and the parents usually like it very much. And as the kids, when the kids are young, the, the grandchildren are, are young, they like coming to their uh, grandparents because it helps. You know, yes. <laughs> they, yes. they get to sleep. So a lot of yeah. expense and cooking and all that. <laughs> yes. And then we, we are experiencing, we have a grandchild child who is 18 already. Oh, wow. wow. So, so when the kids are under teens, and in Israel, they usually live, the families live in a kind of, it's not village, but it's a settlement or settlement. Uh, and there, the life is very, very attractive for young children, for mm -hmm. adolescents. So then they are not so anxious to come to their parents <laughs> because they can, for the, to their grandparents. Their parents, yeah. uh -huh. Because uh, they have their own life. Mm -hmm. So the, those different stages are the stages. And uh, uh -huh. we accept whatever they uh, tell us. For instance, this Shabbat, we are traveling to the States on Saturday night, but when the kids are calling and telling us, we want to come, we won't say no. So uh, <laughs> you have a few families this Shabbat. <laughs> yes. It's a bit of a stretch, but... <laughs> and wow. when, the, when the family expands, the, they also we also have what we call free shopping at parents' house. They usually come on Thursday or Friday morning, they open the fridge, Mommy, can I take this? Can I have that? Can I have this? <laughs> After Shabbat, they take all the, the meals that are cooked already, so they'll have uh, food oh, for the rest wow. of the week. Wow, that's great. That's so helpful great. for those young families. Yes. yes. Uh, another custom is um, when Shabbat enters, the, all the little children are coming to the mother or the grandmother and are uh, getting a, a candy for Shabbat. Oh. And with this candy, they go to the synagogue. So it's like a Shabbat candy. And they know that they won't get it during the weekdays. It's only for Shabbat. So. Oh, oh, that's really special. So it helps them associate that, the Sabbath and going to the synagogue with something sweet and fun. And Exactly. Oh, that's great. Now, when they come on Friday for dinner, do they spend the night? 
some the ones who are observant yes and okay. the ones who are not uh, are traveling back okay yeah, most of our kids are observant so they stay for the whole 26 hours or whatever okay <laughs> yes <laughs> So you, so you, there's a, and I know that when Kelsey was staying with you, you had an extra apartment and then every Shabbat or a lot of the Shabbats, the, it, is, it must be a big part of the tradition to have the, the families come and sleep and needing to accommodate like the, right. the, the grandchildren. Right. And, yeah. It's like a small hotel. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Especially with eight children. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about the day of rest. So, so Friday night, you, we've kicked off Shabbat, there's been a meal, um, and yeah, how, how have you learned over time to use the 24 hours, 26 hours to, to just experience rest? Like, what does that mean, and, and how do you enter into that? Okay, early we'll start. Okay, so I'll start by, by the sheer fact of closing all the um, electronic devices. Uh, yeah. so in some families they cover like the tv they they have a special cover for the um light, light switches, switches but... so, and it's written on it shabbat so it's like shabbat is something that is not connected to this hush and the mm. you know all these uh, these things that you are waking each morning to you're not opening your iphone you're not opening uh, the internet any nothing mm. <laughs> It's interesting because in Israel, uh, many of the wars were during Shabbat, or you know, there were attacks hmm. during Shabbat. The, the um, Yom Kippur wars uh, on Yom Kippur. Yeah. Uh, so if you live in a very religious neighborhood, you don't know anything. You don't know what's going on. <laughs> so sometimes <laughs> some of the people used to go to not a secular people to hear what what was the, you know i heard the bomb was it a, a, a attack or what what was it mm. but you don't open the radio you don't open the tv and it it's very happen. very it's it you know and it's uh, i think it's very educational for the kids mm -hmm. because uh, there is a force that is stronger than the parents uh, saying such a thing it's not it's not my my father is saying don't open the tv because you are watching too much yeah it's it's, it's beyond that. that it's beyond right so That's, it's very very special it's like what um i think herschel talks about entering into kind of like this timeless space and when you have all those devices they, they're you. telling you yeah you're becoming extremely conscious of the passage of time and right. yeah when you cover all of that you enter into like a like a different kind of time right yeah yeah, yeah. talking about that you know in, in judaism we consider number six as representing the material reality because you have six you know directions you have left right down up and uh, forward and backwards so this is the six and this represents this universe of space time but mm -hmm. if you want to go above that there's the seventh element and this is okay. about okay so yeah. that's how we consider it hmm. so um, you know for orly actually she was brought uh, in a religious family so for her it was very natural to observe shabbat because everybody in the family everybody in the neighborhood did that and it was very natural for me i grew up in the soviet union and as you know at that time none of the religions were allowed to practice the mm -hmm. rituals and actually whoever did that could be in big danger mm -hmm. so even people who knew about uh, the jewish uh, customs and religion and the tradition did not uh, transfer it to their children so i was not aware of anything like that so only wow. after coming to israel did i you know start start looking around me and see what's going on. And I was, uh, you know, curious why uh, these customs were not observed in, in, in Russia. And of course, my parents at that time explained to me. And I started just um, exploring for myself what did it mean to keep Judaism, to keep Shabbat. And little by little, I came closer to that because I understood that it's something intrinsic 
for Jewish people to be with that. And after marrying Orly, I became even closer. And I learned a lot more about Shabbat. And now for us, uh, Shabbat is something, as we mentioned, to be connected to ourselves and to God, because in our daily life, we're connected to our smartphone, our internet, our computers, our whatnot. These devices just abstract our focus from the real things. And Shabbat gives us this opportunity to dwell on real values, to get, as I said, connected to, to the universe, to the endless you know, source of spiritualism. The Family Plan Calendar is the new way to keep your family team organized. Plan your rhythms, menu, household chores, and notes for the family all in one place. Visit familyteams.com to purchase. Wow, that's really helpful. So, so you, you, well, you went through a transition where you really had to learn and recapture because of what was going on in the Soviet Union. And Orly, tell us a little bit about your background. Like, what, what was it like growing up for you and in, in your household? And uh, how was Shabbat kept? Okay, so it's interesting because um, my grandfather came from the States and he uh, built a house in a a neighborhood called Mea Shearim in Jerusalem. It's like a very, very, very religious ultra, ultra orthodox. Back yeah. then, he didn't know it. It was just the house he found and he built. And um, so, when I grew up, I had kids who spoke Yiddish <laughs> around me, and we we were considered a bit uh, modern then, because because you know how they. Uh, they it's like Amish people right. okay yes mm -hmm. yeah, sure. uh, so uh, Shabbat there is really really special you see all the people are walking with uh, you know they have special uh, gowns and special uh, hats and it's, it's really really special like you feel it's a different day it's like you're going into a different world mm -hmm. and there's uh, no transportation on the streets people walk just on the streets, right. wherever it's it's really. And there is like a street that is a uh, my mother, my father used to call it like the um fashion street. All <laughs> the women are walking <laughs> with their hats and you know all the things that are uh, festive for, clothes. Yeah, you know. for Shabbat, yeah. so they are like walking and uh, with the kids and carriages. Uh, so this was Shabbat for me. And another thing that was really interesting there, there. It was, um, there are special things that are, um, how would I say, this Kiddush, I said, that the, the Kiddush is the, the uh, ceremony of uh, drinking the wine and all that. And we, we used to do it in the synagogue. And there are special um, uh, kind of um, ochel, food, mm -hmm. that, yeah. dishes that, again, as I said, are on the stove for the whole night and mm. the whole community is eating it and it's big called, big big pots you know it's kind <laughs> of a quiche wow. but a special quiche and uh, when i was a child there was uh, there are stories about that like they had this house because they didn't have those hot uh, stoves everywhere so there was a house with a hot stove and all the synagogues used to cut to bring their food from there so you saw uh, people walking with carriages of this food going to this synagogue and that synagogue as children we used to run after those people and it was you know it's, it was a festive especially yeah look food. at the festival yeah wow yeah, yes, yes. every week yeah. talking, every week talking yes. about food maybe i'll elaborate a little bit on uh, the special food because um, on Shabbat, we're not allowed to, you know, have fire. We're not allowed to cook on Shabbat. So traditionally, several kinds of food have developed. One of them, for instance, is this, um, we, call, we call it cholent. Okay, this is the Yiddish Hebrew name. And what uh, people do is they put so much, you know, so many ingredients, like it could be meat, meat and uh, potatoes and rice, and beans, and uh, they're prepared before Shabbat, and it's all left on this hot plate, okay? And during the night, it stays and stays and absorbs all the juices and, and the smells, and 
the whole house is full of this smell. You, <laughs> you're just smelling it, you become hungry. Okay. <laughs> so, another, for instance, uh, dish is the what we call gefilte fish. It yeah. is, this is stuffed fish. So, mm -hmm. how did that develop? On Shabbat, we're not allowed to sort out the bones from meat, from fish. Okay. So, this is not allowed. This is a forbidden you know, uh, activity. So, what they do, they grind the fish with the bones and make it like uh, cutlets, you know? So mm. that's how you feel the fish develop. Oh, I see. Ah. That makes sense. And the same thing for the, uh, you know, what uh, Orly mentioned, this is quiche, the noodle quiche, we call it the kugel. Again, this oh, is yeah. something that before Shabbat that led the whole night, okay, on this hot plate. And again, it, it, it is delicious. So uh, this is about the cul culinary part of Shabbat. Mm. Wow. Very good. Well, I'd love to hear too, or at least you talk about, um, uh, so both of you, like with, with different stages of your kids, you know, when your kids are really little, um, we hear from a lot of young families that are like, I really want to keep a Sabbath, but, you know, there's a challenge when your kids are little and how do you do that? And so as, as Israelis or Jews have dealt with that challenge of the different stages or different ages of kids, how have um, mothers and fathers sort of dealt with, yeah, that the challenge of trying to rest with the family? I think uh, what you have to do is, and it's, you know, it's a challenging thing these days because the, the um, parents are uh, so much used to uh, having a babysitter uh, uh, with the iPhone, smartphone or iPad or whatever. And now, and on Shabbat, they don't have a babysitter. So uh, on Shabbat, parents actually find themselves play games with the kids and are uh, connecting with them much more. Mm -hmm. um, we have uh, among our grandchildren, we have more uh, boys than girls. So it's usually the time that if they come to us, it's the time for a uh, basketball players and all kinds of ball plays and, uh, and a lot of uh, walking and field trips and all these things that because you are not allowed to travel mm. so you do that but all, all that is done between the meals and the uh, going to synagogue so it's, it's kind of very very special uh, I think kids like it because they understand it's special it's it's a special time with their parents mm. they don't have any other time but I see among my grandchildren a different um, attitudes towards it. And I think it depends on how strong the parents um, are uh, exercising or mm -hmm. exercising the religion. Because okay. mm -hmm. if, if the, the kids, you know, the kids are the barometer of everything we, we, we think and we feel. So if the kids feel that it's, you know, it's, it's a bit of a nuisance to the parent. Hmm. So they will uh, they will ask, okay, when is Shabbat over? And so on. They know they won't they won't open the TV, but it's hard for them. It's not, but if it's you know, it's it's life, that's how it works, and it's a law that is uh, above everything. So the kids just accept it, they 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 will just do uh, whatever is needed and they understand. Really, really little if, thing. If parents help them to fill their time with meaningful activities, with learning the Torah, connecting through games, but not, they can understand and then appreciate and then even love something that they at first they miss. You know, they miss their smartphone, the, the, the iPad, looking, you know, watching games, uh, sports, whatnot. But if uh, the parents are successful in delivering the right message, kids get it and then it develops within them mm. it's it's not so easy it's not so easy there are a lot of temptations you know outside especially if they have uh, friends who are not observant okay mm -hmm. and then they would tell them okay you know, come on let's play let's do this let's travel there um it, it, it's hard but uh, again as already mentioned if the parents are strong and uh, meaningful enough for their kids the kids get it and and, and accept it and love it and, uh, you know, what's interesting at different stages, you asked um, when uh, kids get married, okay, 
uh, something interesting in our family happened because we come, we are Ashkenazi Jews, both Orly and I. And many of our kids married uh, Sephardic Jews, okay? Mm -hmm. So new traditions came to us, you know, new dishes that we didn't know about those, new songs, new blessings, new expressions, new ways of learning the Torah. So it's it, all integrated into our tradition and it's, it's really fascinating. It's fabulous. It's, yeah. it's really wow. fabulous. Mm. That's neat. I like what you're saying because I think a lot of what um, Americans or the people that we talk to a lot that they struggle because in America, a Saturday is a day for all the sports games. It's a day to get housework done. It's the day to, you're not at work. So you're getting everything done that you didn't get done throughout the week. And for them to think it's like the day people have birthday parties or baby showers. And for them to think how, to stop doing that or to not go to that party or to, you know, all these things, it's very foreign to them, but many people are willing to try and they, they at least say, well, if it's this close to our family, we'll go to their birthday party, but we're not doing it for friends or for, they have different ways of dealing with that. Um, but I like what you're saying about a lot of it's up to the parents. Right. Um, you know, we live in a culture here where everything's open, the stores are open, all everyone's driving their car. There's no outside influence saying this is a special day. We should right. all together close this down or, um, and so I think it's, um, Yoel, what you were saying about the parents setting the tone and having the right. place to say, this is worth fighting for. This mm -hmm. is worth sticking we're going to stick by this and try and try to make it happen and then the kids coming under that um yeah following that yeah you know, the Talmud gives an example there used to be times and signs for shabbat for instance there's a river sambation mentioned in the talmud that it changed it on shabbat it changed the course of its flow it would flow in the reverse okay so there were signs of that and it seems to us many like a legend but I can tell you from my personal experience, uh, it was a few years ago, um, I visited my friend up in the Galilee. And uh, at that time, his son was four years old, okay? And uh, he told me that this boy could sense coming of Shabbat. And he would become, he would behave differently just a few hours before Shabbat. He would sort of shine. He would feel the presence of Shabbat. Wow. And uh, when I was there, it was, you know, Friday. I think it was about 1 or 2 p.m. And I saw the boy shining. You know, he was four years old. Nobody told him about Shabbat. It was his internal feeling of presence of Shabbat. So spiritual people can feel that, can attest for Shabbat. Mm. Yeah. It, one of the things that's really surprised us in our kind of circles is that virtually everyone that we've we've seen start Shabbat started to practice it from Saturday uh, night through Sunday, and um, and then we watched as one by one as as they as they all independently started to shift to Friday night through Saturday. We just watched this happen. I remember one day with a bunch of our friends who were practicing Shabbat on Sunday and had shifted to Saturday. We all like realized we all had done it independently. And I, I started to believe that, yeah, is there something, you know, when it says God bless this day, I, I do yeah. think there's something uh, in the presence of the Sabbath and that that day does matter um, in some, in some, in some fashion. So that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. um, I, so one of the questions I had for you guys too, is about, it, so it, um, in, in American culture, there is maybe two uh, multi-generational meals that we do on an annual basis, Thanksgiving and Christmas dinner. Um, and some, some people it's just Thanksgiving. And it's a little bit of a joke in our culture because when you only meet once a year, you know, for dinner with, as a family, it can be a little rough. <laughs> so <laughs> people, uh, you know, they're not used to talking and, and sharing. And, um, but in, in Israel, it's this, this multi-generational uh, pattern of, of doing this, you know, at least once a month, but sometimes every week, you know, as depending on which, parts of the extended family come together. What, what do you think the practice of Shabbat has done for the, the Jewish or Israeli family? Like how, how, how important is that? How, how, that, how has that impacted the family culture, you, do you think? 
It's interesting to ask that uh, uh, in the light of the uh, pandemic that we went through, hmm. because uh, it was really, really rough for uh, many families, especially uh, with the elderly people, because usually the elderly people are invited to the uh, the middle, yeah, the middle generation, not the younger, but the middle. And for two years, that didn't happen. So they didn't have the grandmother or the grandfather in the mm. uh, around. Uh, because actually what happens during the holidays in Israel and Shabbat is that the family is uniting really, really frequently. Mm. We... we uh, we get to know each other better and the um, uh, cousins and nephews are uh, getting involved. And it's really, really nice because uh, I don't think that they get this chance in any other situation. Hmm. As we said, they are not coming and sitting across to uh, the TV. They come and they speak or they come or they play together. And during the meal, they are, you know, they are uh, singing together. So it's a whole different uh, culture, as I said. Yes. And, and now in Israel, we have um, observing Jews. Uh, we have like light observing Jews or non-observing Jews. But what's interesting that uh, even for non-observing Jews, Shabbat is the day they would come to the synagogue, okay, listen and recite the Torah portion on that Shabbat, and uh, they, they would make Kiddush, okay, and then they co- can go and uh, watch the, you know, football game or whatnot, okay, mm-hmm. but still it gives this opportunity for everyone to feel around Shabbat part of our people, okay, and mm-hmm. we even have a saying, more than uh, Jewish people kept Shabbat, Shabbat kept them as a people. Mm, so, yeah. so really it is a social activity. It is a unifying day. It is a day where we can uh, you know, become stronger as a family and as people as well. And a very common uh, question people ask each other, where are you in Shabbat? Or where are you eating on this Shabbat? Mm. It's kind of, it's, it, it resembles a, the way you approach this Shabbat. Are you alone with your wife or are you going out? Are you going to your parents? It's... Uh, there's a, an example I can give you when I worked uh, you know, in the high tech industry, um, I had to travel and meet with the vice president of technology of 3M, okay, in Minnesota. So um, we had uh, some conversations and discussions. It was, you know, to, I had to be able to sign a a contract with them. And we were supposed to end our meetings on uh, on a Thursday, and I had time to fly back to Israel. But uh, it was a pretty rough negotiation that time. So we continued to uh, till the very late Thursday, and we decided to meet again on Friday. So what did I do? tried to find directory of Jewish people. I called the uh, Chabad rabbi and he invited me to stay on Shabbat. Mm-hmm. So when uh, I told our, my colleagues from 3M that I was invited to stay on Shabbat with a family, so they asked me, are they your relatives? I said, no. Did you know them from Israel? I said, no. So they said, how can a stranger you know, invite someone for Shabbat the whole 26 hours to stay in the house? You know? And you know, for me it wasn't strange, but then I realized, yeah, it could be, it could appear strange to others, but that's the way you know we act towards each other. Mm. So on Shabbat, we also host lonely soldiers or some people who don't have to stay anywhere. So this is very common, and it again demonstrates how it unites us as yes. people. It seems like it wow. really cements the the culture of hospitality because I, I, I've been in Israel before, and I'll be having lunch with somebody I've never met. And, you know, at the end, they'll say, Hey, come on over for Shabbat. You know, (laughs) I've had that experience multiple times. And it is, it is an amazing thing to, to be inviting people that you don't know, or barely know, um, to have this shared experience. And it creates a different kind of culture. That's really beautiful. This is great. Thank you so much for all these insights. This has been really helpful. I don't know if there's anything else that sort of bubbles bubbling to the surface 
about the Sabbath that has made it particularly meaningful or any practices you guys want to share before we uh, close up? Um, well, you know, already mentioned the challah bread and it's something yeah. again that smells <laughs> so, so nicely. And uh, uh, I remember just something, uh, you know, many people in Israel during the, I think the last two or three decades or even more, who were totally, you know, or far away from being observed, if you will. So as you spoke about the movement of uh, keeping Shabbat among the Christians in, in America, so we have movement again of people who didn't know, who were distant from that tradition. They're trying now to also keep Shabbat and then, you know, being becoming fully religious. So one of the rabbis, um, he used to host many people when he was in uh, India, actually. So, you know, many Israelis, they travel all around the world. And then on Shabbat, they gather, again, even totally unreligious people together with the rabbi. And um, after a couple of uh, such meetings, one person came to this rabbi and told him, okay, uh, I want to become religious. So the rabbi was very happy. Uh, so he, so he, he told him, you think it was your uh, sermons or your talks about the Torah. Yes, they're important, but the most important thing for me was the challah bread of your wife that she baked. <laughs> 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 it was something that moved me so much. <laughs> That's great. Yes. Yeah, there's a special taste of Shabbat that brings you, helps you have that spiritual experience. You know, yes. one of the things that we've really enjoyed and we have experienced more as we've kind of reconnected to more Hebrew roots of our faith is that everything feels more like, like it's tangible, like smells and food and family and like grounded in mm -hmm. the beautiful uh, elements of reality. So I think that the Sabbath can really help people experience that. So well, thank you guys so much for this. I, I wanted to too, just take a second and um, uh, hear about uh, if there's anything that you think our audience might be interested in that you guys are working on. Um, April mentioned with Olpan Or, uh, there's a lot of families we know that do homeschool and that would love to teach their kids Hebrew. Um, I know that Yoel, you also publish like Torah portion and news. Uh, uh, there are all kinds of ways for people to in engage with Hebrew at every kind of level and also in meaningful ways. So yeah, anything that you, you could let us know about, about that. Uh, well, um, there are a couple of things, a couple of new projects that we are doing. Uh, one of them is with the ILTV. This is the Israeli International Channel. They broadcast it in America for uh, Jewish people, non-Jewish people, many Christians are subscribed to their channel. And what we're doing now is we're producing every week a Torah portion that we discuss and we bring the insights of that Torah portion related to the roots of Hebrew words, the two traditions and various uh, aspects of that. Uh, we discuss it in their studio. Uh, so they have it on their channel. The ILT channel has this Torah portion. So I think it's, it could be interesting for your audience. Like then you. we have uh, only one of these. Okay. So you said about people who are homeschooling and teaching their kids. So we actually during the last 10 years, if you want, we can share the screen and show you. We have uh, lots of ebooks. Hmm. Ebooks meaning books that you can uh, get on your computer and uh, open them and study with your kids. And uh, recently, in the last two years, we designed books for uh, little kids kindergarten, kindergarten level. And, oh, wow. and first grade and it was uh, it was really amazing because during the pandemic we got so many uh, letters from parents who said that it saved their kids uh, education oh because, wow uh, yes you can really i think we think we uh, did with, yeah we have many letters from parents who, you know, their kids study, let's say, in a Jewish school, okay? But the parents don't know Hebrew at all. But mm -hmm. with these books, especially with the kindergarten level books, the parents were able to study together with the kids. And they actually were able to study the Hebrew alphabet, the initial, the initial vocabulary and whatnot. So 
this is really for us fascinating. And as already mentioned during the COVID time, um, they were able to learn with the kids, uh, both in, in school teachers and parents. And now we have actually uh, our uh, curricula ex expands and encompasses uh, from age four to age 18 for schools in kindergarten. And well, another, another thing we uh, kind of understood uh, during those two years, because people didn't come to Israel and uh, all our courses in Israel were shut uh, off. Our, actually, our offices in Tel Aviv are closed. And, uh, yeah, we have those. Yeah. Uh, so, but we, we designed uh, courses that a person can take the course and have the teacher with him. It's like a digital course. Mm -hmm. You know, there are lots of digital courses, but what we did is we, uh, we have teachers who teach it and study with you and show you the videos. We have lots of videos. So they show you the video and you speak with the teacher and then you exercise and then you record yourself. It's a whole, we, we uh, you all found out a platform to do it on. So uh, we have that from the total beginner level to a very high. And recently what happened is that um, many, uh, there, there is probably a movement among schools that uh, try to, teach Hebrew to their kids, but they don't find a teacher. Yeah. <laughs> they don't find them. So, um, so what we had uh, suggested is take this course, put a teacher in class. The teacher doesn't have to know any Hebrew. Hmm. They just have to open the uh, computer and the, the kids will work with it because it's very structured. Mm. So uh, it's really cute. We wanted them to film it because the whole class is watching the teacher from Israel, our, our teacher, oh, yeah. and they speak with her and they do. It's like like you came to Israel and did it here. So it's bringing the teacher there to class and they have all kinds of uh, exercise to do. It's, uh, it's hybrid. Oh, that's and, great. Uh, that's kind of a way yeah, of it, it, reaching it. out to people all over the world through a, a hybrid courses. Yeah, we realize that unlike many other subjects where people nowadays are able to study on their own with languages, you need to have a partner. You need to speak, mm -hmm. you need to listen. So that's what we did. We combined the self-study you know, course or portion with the guided portion from our teacher. So it and then they have to record themselves or to, uh, to video themselves at the end of each uh, session. So it's really nice. They, they feel engaged. Hmm. They feel as if they are, and it's, it's really, it's, it's one of the newest things. Oh, that's great. That sounds really neat. Yes, yeah, so, well, I love that, that you guys are always on the cutting edge of where technology meets uh, language acquisition. And so I, I can't recommend enough to you guys that if you're interested in, in learning Hebrew or, or seeing your kids learn Hebrew, check out Ulpan Or and what Yoel and Orly are doing. So thank you guys so much for taking the time thank you. tonight. Thank you for thank hosting you. us and Mazal Tov on, uh, on the wedding, on the coming wedding. <laughs> thank you thank very you. much. <laughs> Thank you for listening to the Family Teams podcast. If you're enjoying this content or have learned something new, please make sure to leave a rating and review and share with a friend. To stay up to date with our events, new content, and products, you can follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Family Teams.